Hi, I'm Susan. I'm from World Peaceful or Happiness Australia, and I'm in quarantine, which is the new normal. This is my 13th day, and I can report, no, I do not have coronavirus, and I knew I didn't have it, and the chances of me getting it are extremely slight. Everyone will go, no, look at the media. Well, we are given percep perceptions through the media. We are at a time in history where it's very hard to determine what is true and what is not, what is reality and what is not, what we actually want and what we don't want. It's a time of, as has been coined, great disruption. There's truth in that. But like any collapse of towers, there is a resurrection afterwards. Now, what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to read to you a poem I wrote in 2012. Now, the poem is called The Future Looks Back to See Why the World Collapsed. I've always had, uh, well, not always, but let's just say in the last number of years, I've had a feeling that, that things were going to collapse. So when I've heard rhetoric around issues like unemployment and homelessness and economic growth is a great panacea, that all becomes null and void in a collapsing economy. And what is particularly interesting is to see where money has come from and where it's being directed to in the midst of the greatest hardship of people. And there will certainly be contention around the creation of credit and certainly the indebting of nations forcing them to collapse. There's also issues of central power around the ownership of central banks and the ability to create conditions of change through banks, through interest rates, through the printing of money, through monetary policy. So we're in a time of a great awakening is what this really is. Now you can look at it as the cup half empty or the cup half full and you'll have days where you experience both. Any form of disruption is very unsettling because you're uncertain and when you feel powerless, that's when mental health issues start to become a problem, particularly if you can't find a way out. So I'm gonna read you this poem and then you can decide what you feel about what is coming. So it's called The Future Looks Back to See Why the World Collapsed. I'm in the future looking back. The fire of my inquiry remembers the embers. What burns and what doesn't? Why the world changed my world? The grandchildren, they watch me wide-eyed, as if I'm a relic from another planet who lived through the Great Awakening as many worlds were shaking as veils came off. Every heart was aching for change and it is a wish granted. The rise and the fall of the industrial age moved humanity from market-based social structures to economies of vast scales, from plots to broad-scale agriculture, from campfires to massive electrical grids emitting electromagnetic pulses. Yet many did not have the finger on the pulse as humanity was in a critical condition, as greed was a seed that had been planted. And it was this that produced the rotting fruit. In this world, winners are grinners and losers discarded on the margins. Only those who can afford the lifestyle of kings can have it. 
as power and control appeared shiny like gold. Those who can't were the slumdog millionaires in waiting, surviving on the crumbs to find in the end the gold standard was the mirage of a fool's gold. Great stock was placed on energy. As energy produced greater stock, it was an asymmetrical stock exchange. As the few became super rich, manufacturing demand without understanding was the grandstanding view of the new world order. Yet it was the scaffolding that was unstable. There was chaos inherent in the structure. A deck of cards in search of the winning hand, yet they were stacked precariously, for the house of cards was dwelling on the subprime, falling as a domino effect. As the butterfly flaps, triggered by excessive credit, driven by the greed of fueling inflated needs in fear of losing. It was an unreal economy, not grounded in serving community, unable to reach for the unity of the commons, floundering in balance sheets, but never balanced with our true nature, unaware of the one life circulate circulatory system as bounty was extracted reformed printed to control the game gambling in the casino of the stock exchange was the name game as greed was good and robin hood was not a merry man greed was the unseen contagion capturing the hearts of millions in search of instant gratification that feels good. Seducing lonely hearts clubs parading as success and living like kings to fill the gap that knew not the beauty of innocence. Sitting back in satisfaction, they looked over their smokestacks and threw the chips down. As the inheritance was gambled away as one's right in free enterprise, for free enterprise was an unquestioned right. Mother Earth lay groaning under the excessive weight as carbon sinks were chopped down. The world cake was carved up. Ice melted as there was no more ice on top. To find waves streaming into lakes through flood plan pans of debris as if crying and blocked. Terror was dying and shocked, bursting her banks as the bubble had burst to find you can't eat money. This time humanity arose as the rose surrounded by thorns. As they knew the writing was on the walls on the street, they formed collectives, community cooperatives, alternating currencies. They self-regulated self-sufficiency. Local government created allotments and free rides. For investments were not worth the paper trail. Sustainability was not just recycling, they surmised. They realized the puzzle was to find our true nature, living in harmony to respect the planet as our birth mother. For this is the real bounty they have forgotten. Many indigenous have lived beyond our dreams, yet within their means, for they were not mean, for they had seen the dream time calling for respect. Yet they were seen as failures in a system slowly failing from neglect. The Great Awakening showed a lazy society uses little energy to work efficiency, efficiently. Nature does not work, it flows. 
for all parts of spirals supplying the whole. Humanity saw itself in others on reflection, discovering universal values were inherent and inalienable. Virtues flow, they do not block, for nature is the one system. It is a closed system open to change. Humanity found its wisdom in balancing yin and yang. For balance was allowance, joy and enthusiasm. Freedom was in non-resistance, non-judgment and non-attachment. For adaptation to change was not rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic or a competition for recognition, but a titanic effort to unlearn past despairs, to share what is fair. As the new paradigm shifted gears, love became successive, selflessness flowing as an inner knowing, preserving the real wealth that is unseen, planting the seed of self of sufficiency is being an optimum self-regulating cycle, organic reorganization. For in a healthy human community of shared interests, there is no greed. Only good seeds planted in harmony with the celestial bodies. And family the bouquet blooming in radiance. This is the romance life supports. Geometric symmetry purports. Deeds in unison with universal creeds. For the human, human community mirrors the unity of the commons. A cosmos of interconnecting clusters. As humanity naturally returns to first principles on time. Retrospectively, we were able to see then look at our folly, at our competition, at our cruelty in self-serving, to realize serving the self was the mantra of this civilization. Of course, this is not in harmony with our true nature. A rote education that socialized greed is good. That is why many were depressed Many felt suppressed, for they were not expressing their true inheritance. For the purpose of this life is happiness, not abundance. And karma operates on what goes around comes around. This is a universal law that does not allow objections. As natural justice is fairness, naturally seeking the middle ground. And this can only be found in unity. After the fall of Adam, we saw the eve of a new world. One much kinder, as we learn to live in cycles, not squares. We replanted a new future using low energy technologies, celebrating the freedom that had come. For we sang an unchained melody in concordance with universal rhythms. To find the true power lay within the heart. As this link to universal intelligence, to balance the heart and the head became this new teaching. To value the earth as thyself and be true was the wholeness that became holy. We were able to see roles fall away as our true nature grew from a magnificent spring, turning into an ocean current, moaning, moving as one in harmony onto a new earth. So that's the poem that I wrote in 2012, The Future Looks Back to See Why the World Collapsed. It's funny, I was looking over my blog and that poem I just happened to see someone has looked at it and I thought to myself when I had a quick look over it I thought oh, when did I write that 
And 2012, of course, was a very pivotal change as well. It didn't manifest in the way many did think, but it was most definitely a shift. Now, the sort of the words, um, there are more, there are more things to this world, Horatio, than have been thought of in your philosophy. So it's a little bit like there is much that we do not know, the knowing of which changes everything. Imagine sitting in the future a hundred years from now, looking back at this time. This time of biotechnology companies who are tinkering with the blueprint of genetics, a time where people manipulate germs in order to fight other human beings. This is a time where people are very transfixed by money, believing that their whole identity is linked to what they own their status, whether somebody loves them or not, their children. We're in a time where the information that comes to us is commercially driven. It's not coming from a philosophy of visible truth. Very few speak the truth in the times we're in. And Often there is a vested interest sitting behind those messages. So it is a time where we must become vigilant to what we're hearing. If we're falling into fear, we're out of alignment with our true nature. Our true nature is not fearful in actual fact. It's very loving and it's harmonizing naturally with the world. Much of the peace teachings are about recalibrating back to what is natural within us. So to cope with times like this, at mo in moments we can become very overwhelmed, particularly when we start to recognize what's going on. That's why this time is called the Great Awakening. We awaken. And it's funny, people within the, uh, you know, probably the New Age movement, I'd say, probably think it's going to be just a moment where you just go, wow, I wake up. Phew. And for some that could be the case, but my inner feeling is that that's not what the awakening is about. <laughs> it's actually awakening to what's been going on. <laughs> and you go, oh, my God, I didn't know that. This is what they've been doing. Oh, I see. But this awakening is, it's a little bit like, growing up where you may as a child have played with things toys and then you grow out of them and you might start reading books then you might grow out of that and start going out then you might grow out of that and and have a vocation the awakening is not unlike the growing up but this is a growing up and out into a completely different way of seeing So rather than seeing the cup half empty, we look to see if the cup is half full. And of course it is. Rather than looking at the poverty in the moment, why not look at the abundance of what is so? Maybe spending time with family is a time to reconcile, to resolve conflict, to deal with your own issues that have been suppressed. Things that can seem very negative can wittingly or unwittingly produce the conditions for us to actually deal with what is difficult. Often people will seek to escape. They escape in drugs, alcohol, sex, going out all the time, watching videos, playing games. The, the, the gaming is definitely a an outcrop of people who are wanting to escape this reality 
But the Great Awakening is facing this reality with wide, eyes wide open. Not shut, but open. Because we've got to start to confront the things that we have denied. The only reason anyone can feel powerless is when they give their power away. If we're fearing things, we are pinching off the joy that's sitting there as the potential of that moment. So rather than falling into fear and imagining a future that everything's collapsing, which it may well do, certainly the way they're, they're orchestrating this, that is precisely what is being done. Regardless of the motive behind these actions, the reality is what the reality is. And in this moment is where reality is. What if everything that happens to you is actually what you're wanting on a higher plane? Sometimes, even when we were children, things happened and we may have cried and thought it was terrible, but it was part of our learning process. We may not have been aware at that time that this particular event may well manifest later in our lives as something that was a key learning. I believe the times we're going through right now is learning to relinquish the things that we've attached our identity to. So non-attachment is very critical. Non-attachment to materialism. Non-judgment. So rather than condemning people that you might think are responsible, it doesn't mean that truth can't be spoken. Certainly it will be, and it is being. There are many whistleblowers, but that's different from judging them is projecting something negative onto another party. Discernment is looking at that party without judgment. It's a little bit like if I look at this cup and I go, oh, this is a boring cup. I don't like it. You know, look at the shape. It's got nothing on it. Yuck. That's judgment. But if I look at the cup and I say it's a cup, it's got a handle, its colouring is white, it's porcelain. I can drink from this. That's discernment. And I can drink my coffee. So how we see changes what we see. And the only way you can change what you see is by changing what you believe within. For me, I have no fear of the coronavirus at all. I really don't. I have none. I, I, if I got it, I'm not in fear about it. It's fine. So I'm still living exactly as I lived prior to Wuhan, China. I was always working on my own anyway. And the social distance, well, they call it social distancing. I always take exception to that because it should be physical distancing as World Health Organization has written. The social distancing implies that we need to not connect emotionally and I consider that to be problematic. However, in my life, the physical distancing was fairly normalised just because I was always moving around areas where I didn't know anyone, <laughs> you know, and just naturally you would physically distance anyway because we all have a zone around us that to me was the physical distancing. The masks are another matter and I'm just going to go still on that. The feeling com coming straight to me was in the future looking back, okay, the masks. Immediately the thought of gagging comes up and that's what I see when I see people wearing masks and the fact that it's replicating, I'm seeing it like a virus, it replicates because people have been told to do it, they don't want to do it. But if they don't do it, there's a negative consequence. So I just want to go still on the, the masks. So why are they called face masks? Face masking. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely that. Certainly it makes the virus appear to be everywhere because everyone's wearing it. And because it's unseen, it can create the perception within the mind that the virus is everywhere. 
and then people become frightened. Now, it's the fear you've got to watch out for because the fear, if it continues, you'll, re you'll change your neural networks and you'll become very paranoid about touching things and it will actually change you. You can wear gloves if you're concerned. For me, I'm not wearing gloves because, because I have no fear around it. It's a great freedom in not having fear, let me tell you, because then it's, it frees me up to actually observe and look at all the people. So what I'm seeing is this labelling of this supposed uh, coronavirus, and I say supposed because it's, I've done research and certainly there is not 100% certainty around it. So for me, it will always be alleged. And when I say alleged, it's not a conspiracy theory statement. It is a statement that makes allowance that there may be more to this than I know that the, the knowing of which would change everything. So it means that my mind is open. I'm not rigid and going, you are doing the wrong thing, you are doing the right thing, because to be honest with you, only time will tell what was appropriate or inappropriate. It's not even right or wrong. It's more, what is the appropriate response? What is the reality on the ground? What is the nature of the problem? How are we tackling it? Are we projecting a compliance framework around it and calling it risk management? Or do we use a therapeutic approach which deals with mental health, given that this is the real disruption that's going on, is people feeling a, a loss of control, people frightened that they're going to die, so they're facing mortality, people becoming frightened of other people as a virus becomes weaponized. Now, I use that terminology because the bioweapon issue is certainly on the table here. The weaponization of it is, you are a threat to me. I see you as potentially dangerous because they've told me that it, won't it may not manifest. It might manifest later. They may be a carrier. This is how we weaponize a virus. Because we're not doing it with influenza, which takes more people's lives. Certainly from the research I've done here in Australia, I think at the moment we're looking at 190, and I will say alleged because I would need to see the evidence as to are these definitely COVID-19 deaths because there are certainly doctors speaking about having to label a death as COVID-19 when it wasn't actually um, having an autopsy. I think there's a lot of issues around it because you've got to understand it's a... It's a coupling of things such as shortness of breath, headaches and respiratory, but we can have 20 other medical conditions that may well be, this, be similar. And then we've got the SARS-CoV-2, which has got an 80% DNA likelihood with this COVID-19. So again, you know, these are, there's areas here for error. I used to be a market analyst and we used to call it the um, error of the estimate. So there's a a margin around the static statistics. I'm also interested in how they gathered it, how they labelled it, um, how it was categorised, and were these actual deaths definitely this, or are they likely to have come from that? So that's why always I have cautionary um, principle around my assessment of this created crisis because it, it's most definitely created by the governments and there's certainly been groups that have been coming together to practice <laughs> simulations. So there is, you know, the, the World um, Economic Forum in October last year were practicing a coronavirus type of pandemic. So that raises many questions. There's also great profit to be made from the vaccine side of this issue. So commercial interests come in. And because we have public-private partnerships in government where lobbying is extensive when you're coming from a business perspective, there's a merging of interests. When economic growth becomes the 
concentrated goal of a government or a business organisation. This is where their interests merge. Now, if it's coming from public well-being, that's a completely different area. Representation by a political figure is a completely different situation from industrial representation or special interest representation. We're all human. People are susceptible to bias. They may well see that this is the only way and that the crumbs fall off the table and the public eventually will benefit. So there's lots of angles from which we can look at this, but certainly the commercial interests in the vaccine manufacturers, which are a collective group, who have already announced a decade of vaccines. So their interest is expansion in the market of vaccines. As with all market-based economies, and I've mentioned this in the poem, there is always a interest in the expansion of the market. Now, if that becomes weaponized, so we could even look at the military industrial complex need for expansion to make more money. That's the objective. The objective is not defence when it becomes commercial changes. In the pharmaceuticals, the biologicals, the objective is actually not wellness, even though there may well be an outcome where the person no longer shows the symptoms of that disease and they appear to be well. The purpose of the actual technology is to treat disease. So they need disease in order to treat it because they patent the design that comes up with the solution. And then we've got issues of corruption within biologicals where they might well be creating the actual virus itself with specific features that may well exhibit things like respiratory, HIV, they could exhibit these particular tailored expressions, if you like, of disease. This has to be another card on the table here because human beings being human beings, they will seek to corner a market and they might need to create something in order to do it. Or it could be naturally occurring, something novel, something different that's just naturally emerged. But in order to solve the problem, we have to look at the whole array of interests in this, the revolving door within politics where industrialists go into power and then they come back into industry. That's another major card on the table. Then we've got power elites who are extremely wealthy because they participate probably for generations in, in areas that have been extremely lucrative. So they have another perspective. They may well have an attitude or a belief about who they are and who everyone else is. So in the times we're moving through, critical thinking is critical. In the literal sense too, you have to be questioning of everything because the deck chairs are all changing on the Titanic here. And yes, it's a sinking ship, but there are life rafts. There are lifeboats is the words that are coming to me. And I know that lifeboats have been prepared, but I'm talking about it in a metaphysical frame. In my own life, having had the experience of homelessness, lifeboats came for me in many guises or in some of the poetry I've written, they were kind of like life rafts where I was saved or not, but for the most, I have been saved, clearly. So there's the lifeboat idea here where something happens, a shift occurs, and the help that we needed arrives. So when everyone around the world is thinking similarly, we want a better world. We want eco-villages. We want to self-regulate and live self-reliant lives because that harmonises with earth systems. 
we have come to realise that the way we've configured our economic system is only benefiting few people at the expense of the many. And if that many become surf, sur, uh, superfluous due to technology, then this changes everything. The knowing of which changes everything. The social contract changes. Now, for those who aren't aware of a social contract, because many won't be, at university we learned about the social contract, which is an implied contract between, if you like, those who would be seen as rulers over the population. And there's a certain implied agreement. The agreement in many respects is programmed into us as children. We're not actually ever asked in a contractual form, do we agree or disagree with this? We tend to go with what our parents have taught us who have also implied agreement with the way things are. But when you get major disruption of this nature, the contract between those governing and those submitting to that governance changes. And that's what disruption is really about, is the renegotiation of who we are and what we want. Who am I? When things change, it, it's a very fascinating time in, in, a, in a lot of real ways because a little bit like fasting, the gurus fast when they want to um, awaken different ways of seeing or different in talents that are inherent within, they'll go and fast. The denial of things that we have taken for granted is another way of fasting. You may not be consciously fasting, but it is fasting. Plenty of water you need to drink if you want to keep away viral infections. Apple cider vinegar is excellent as an antiviral. Positive thinking is extremely important for good health and well-being. So these contracts that were business as usual are now up in the air. People are working out the world they want. People will come together one way or another as they will feel compelled to consult others about what is going on. It's turned everything upside down. But the inspiration will come to you and I highly advise people to learn to do breathing for calmness. So breathing in, breathing out, let your shoulders drop. Just feel that energy. Breathe in the chai, chi. Breathe out. Breathe in vitality, health and well-being. Breathe out negativity, fear, disempowerment. Breathe in solutions. Breathe out old paradigms that don't work. Breathe in clean energy, free energy. Breathe out all sort of polluting technologies that don't serve us anymore. So in a way, this is kind of like a cleansing that's happening. It's a reset, most definitely. The planet itself is one with who we are as well because we are life force energy ourselves connected literally with the earth systems. We may think that we're separate because we live in houses and we look outside and we like the trees, but we are actually deeply connected and you would know that because if you went off to another planet that had no trees, no oceans, no um, wildlife, suddenly you would crave the earth because you would realise that that is part of you. And, and there would be huge grief around losing it. So when we're treating the planet with impunity and we're treating it as a resource to be exploited, we're not respecting the 
vital um, essence of a planet that's actually a living planet. Like the subatomic level, the Earth being a spherical object and the cellular air, um, level is also what you would call a life force with intelligence, but it's a different form of intelligence. So these intelligences that are all around us that communicate in a whole wide array of languages come in all shapes and sizes are part of earth systems and there is no mistake that they're present here as well as us so when we tinker with the building blocks of life not unlike the nuclear level the atom and i feel a link to the um, nft treaty which is the intermediate missile nuclear treaty that the us has now stepped out of I just felt connection to that when I looked into the subatomic atomic level and the splitting of the atom and the great force that's released through playing with that subatomic level as a child does with matches. We know not what we do because we are disconnected from the whole. And it makes us dangerous to ourselves and the planet too. Sort of blind faith comes to mind too where we're just following these things even science blind faith in it you know and the illusion that everything's stable when it's totally unstable once you start mucking around with the subatomic level you bring you will bring chaos to light definitely so from the future looking back according to my poetry, we will come through this. And yes, there will be a new reality for sure, because we're going to want it. <laughs> Suffering brings it on. <laughs> so in a sense, you could say this is a very positive video. And like all great things, like all great outcomes, you do have to suffer for that, for that trophy. You know, I know in my own life, all the great things that I've done have come with great suffering. <laughs> you know, I've never, ever been able to, even writing books, I always suffered. It was like, oh, why can't I just write this in one inspired moment and it's done? No, technology is here to give me disruption, you know. <laughs> so, so the hardship is part of breaking through the shell. The hardship is the little plant that's breaking up through the hard earth. So imagine a little, little plant trying to get its tendril through the hard soil in order to bloom. We're at the point of the little tendril trying to break through what feels hard. And it's like in any sort of cases where people have been through huge hardship, eventually they come to a point where they just go, you know what, I'm breaking through. And what that time is, is when you no longer fear what is happening and you start to you start to care, you don't care less it's like like what it would look like with the coronavirus would be i just don't care it doesn't mean that you wouldn't clean your hands or you wouldn't socially distance in order to either keep people happy or if you were actually in an area where there was that it's probably a good practice to use um, soap and water in any case and wash your hands properly as just a basic hygiene I'm just saying that to break through that hard earth is to break through all the fears that are coming up due to this disruption, which is part of our evolution and our growth. It's, as I said in the earlier part of the video, it's like growing. You know, you discard those toys and then you might get a book and then you, you enjoy that for a time and then you develop beyond that. And then as an adult, you might meet people or go out. We evolve. And no evolution can happen without the demise of what was an old paradigm. It's a little bit like you lose your house, you lose, you lose everything, let's say. But rather than jump out the window, you choose to push through. And that's the tendril pushing up through the hard earth. 
because it's always darkest before dawn and this dawn is coming and it will be a horizon beyond our imaginings. So don't give up. Don't pull the plug. Don't say it's all finished. It's not. It's just an old paradigm that's dying. And we are addicted to the things within that old paradigm. And this space of not of being denied our freedoms is a time of learning to let go, to detach from what we thought was part of us. It's not. It's a polluting system that's toxic. There's a lot of cruelty that's happening. We're still being violent to one another. We're not caring about the people who are homeless or we're still judging everyone. We have to suffer in order to relate to the rest of humanity to come together because we're we are truly in it together. And we will start to recognize each other in each other. So the suffering happening in Lebanon that we've just noted today, my friend rang to want to reach out to the Lebanese. That's a very beautiful gesture. And if we see our neighbors having problems or you see someone sleeping on the street, go and help them. Don't allow the fear of coronavirus to stop you from extending love into humanity because that other is yourself and that is the awakening. What I do for another, I do for myself. Life happens through me, not to me. In other words, I'm the creator of my reality. On some level, this has come to me for me to learn something. That something may well be the very thing that changes everything. We're here to grow. And in order to do that, you have to relinquish things that you no longer need. And you will expand your awareness of what life is truly about. It's like shifting from one track to the other. We get comfortable listening to the same old track. This awakening is like moving to a new track, a new frequency, they call it. A new way of seeing where we are each other's keepers most definitely. We're living in a mind that loves everyone. And we realize that we are the ones that are causing problems for us. So when we change, the world changes. And that's where the real power is. So when you feel powerless, you're thinking something outside of you has all the power, but you don't. The awakening is simply saying that you actually do have the power, but you don't know that you do. When you awaken, you know that you do. You can take one step and then the next. You can ask a question and then the next. You can step out outside your comfort zone because you've got no choice. You, you haven't got work. You have, to, you have to change things. So one way or another, this is a gift in disguise for sure. So try to see the good in change and be the change you wish to see in what is good. So with that, I'm going to leave you in peace and joy and make the most of this, this moment, which is a momentous moment in human history where the entire world is going through the same thing. Take note of it. Don't let yourself miss a moment because this is really an exciting time to be alive because you're going to really be challenged <laughs> and, and who knows maybe at a higher level that's what you wanted <laughs> but as I said there's a new dawn so it was always darkest before dawn just remember that okay take care much love bye